Okay, so we're going to start by talking about natural selection. So of course I have a picture of my very favorite person alive, not alive, but who has lived, Charles Darwin. Um, and his amazing theory of evolution started with his trip to the Galapagos Islands in which he noticed, which is what you're seeing in this picture right here, that the finches on each of the different islands had different beaks. So as you can see on the end of these projections here, all of these different finches have a different style of beak. And he noticed this and realized that something had happened here, right, where these finches are able to adapt, and we'll talk about adaptations um, in just a second, but they're able to adapt um, to different environments depending on the island that they live on and the food source that they are ingesting. So that was a big part of his um, initial discovery is that he was noticing that the environment or environmental pressures are actually able to lead to adaptations or changes amongst um, a population so far enough into making these different species. So there are eight things that need to be true for natural selection to occur. So I'm going to run through them because it's really important that you're familiar with these in order to understand how natural selection is actually occurring. Okay, so first and foremost, populations have to have an enormous potential to reproduce. If populations are not reproducing, then they're not going to be evolving and natural selection will not be occurring. Okay, because natural selection, this change over time that we're going to be looking at um, based on the environment needs to have that time and those generations to come um, in order to actually see this change occurring. Secondly, population sizes uh, remain stable. This is just a, a fact based on um, Darwin's studies, but also what we see all across the world. For the most part, a population size will remain stable, um, mainly because of numbers three and four. Resources in different areas are limited, right? Regardless, we are out using our resources on Earth. I'm sure we can all agree. Um, so resources are going to be limited, and therefore individuals will need to compete for survival. So because we have limited resources, we don't have enough for everyone and individuals must compete for survival, our population sizes are going to remain relatively stable. Along with that, you need to know that there is variation within a population. So this is going to be a big topic for tonight, that there is variation. So what that means is there's change within population. There are different alleles, there are different adaptations. Um, when we're looking at a population, everyone doesn't look like an identical clone. Okay, we're going to find out that variation is essentially the most important part of natural selection. Um, that we would have no different things that we could act upon to select for or against. Okay, um, last three, most variation is inheritable. So it's important to know that the variation that we're seeing can be passed down to offspring. If it's not able to be passed down, then it can't contribute to natural selection because it will die within that generation as opposed to being passed on from generation to generation, okay? Only the most fit individuals survive. So Darwin's theory, survival of the fittest. Um, on the AP exam, they're not a big fan of you writing survival of the fittest. So that's something to keep in mind, especially if that's something, a phrase that you're used to hearing or hear from a teacher. Um, it's not necessarily as accurate as just saying that organisms who are more capable of survival and reproduction are going to survive and reproduce and therefore their offspring will inherit those traits. Okay, so that's just a more scientifically sound way of saying survival of the fittest. And it shows that you have a greater understanding of natural selection. Okay? Lastly, evolution occurs as favorable traits accumulate in a population. Okay? So some favorable traits may come and go, um, and we won't really see evolution occurring. It's when we see favorable traits, things that are allow allowing an organism to survive and to reproduce, that we really see that transformable change that we would consider evolution or natural selection, okay? Um, so to go back just a slide and take a look back at um, our original picture of Charles and his finches, okay? These beaks are all allowing his finches to do those two things that are the most important things in life, survive, right, and reproduce. They're able to survive because they're better fit to a food source on their island. And because they're able to survive, they're therefore also more fit to reproduce and we see those traits appear in the next generation. 
Okay, so there are a number of examples that we'll talk about with natural selection. It's definitely very important to know about the finches on the Galapagos. They're also a really good example of something that we call biogeography. Okay, and biogeography is the study of how various environments can affect the species that live in those environments. And because these islands are all close together yet have their own environment, um, it's one of our primary examples of biogeography and therefore it shows up a lot on tests and quizzes. All right, so let me skip ahead. I'm gonna show you a couple different times, types of selection that can occur. These are really important. I'm sure you have maybe seen a graph like this before, especially if you've talked about natural selection. But this is going to show you the different ways that we can select for or against traits depending on different environmental conditions. Okay, so that top graph is just your normal Gaussian bell-shaped curve, okay, of a starting population of this case in mice. Um, in which we see a strong increase in the middle phenotype. Okay, so the middle phenotype, we have kind of a, a gradient of like this lighter tan color and this darker brown color, okay, it's like a medium brown. Okay, so you can see that middle gradient color and um, that is representing again a normal bell curve, which is usually what we use to describe a starting population, a normal distribution, okay. And then you'll notice that there's three different possible outcomes for this population based off of three different drastic environmental changes, okay? So all the way on the left is something that we call stabilizing connection. Think about it, if you are a stable person, you are taking the middle ground, you are kind of middle of the road, doing exactly what you're supposed to be. So for stabilizing selection, we'll actually see a push towards that middle kind of medium blend of colors there um, as the favored trait for, in this case, these mice, okay? So this may happen um, due to some sort of environmental change that, let's say these mice have a couple different environments that they can live on and all of a sudden it just becomes sort of a lighter brown dirt or wood chip that they're living on, that's going to allow those middle brown mice to have a better chance of surviving against predators and therefore those are the ones that are producing offspring. So we see the increase in the spike in the middle there. Next to directional and disruptive, um, my students seem to always get these two mixed up just because they both begin with the same letter. Um, but if you just listen to what the word is saying, directional moves in one direction, okay? So you're moving towards one extreme phenotype. We're gonna talk about peppered moths in just a second, which is a classic example of, um, of this directional selection. Okay, um, but what you need to be familiar with is just that one extreme phenotype is favored here. And it can't be the middle phenotype because that's what we just talked about with stabilizing selection. That's something that sometimes my students get mixed up on as well. So in this example of directional selection, we're pushing towards the extreme phenotype being the darker mice. And again, since we're talking about natural selection, we're talking about some sort of environmental change that's leading to these darker mice having a better chance of survival and reproduction, okay? Usually if we're thinking about the environment, maybe there are heavy rains, the ground is very muddy, and dark mice can blend in better, okay? Lastly, disruptive selection. I always think of like, if you're disrupting class, you're just like slamming into the middle of my class and ruining everything. Um, so if you have that top graph there and you just slammed the middle of the hill right there, it would create these waves up on the side, um, which would create quite the disruption. Um, so if you look at disruptive selection, you'll see you're actually favoring both extreme phenotypes. You know, okay? So you're seeing the very, very light colored mice and the very, very dark colored mice, but not very many of those medium browns. Okay? So those three types of selection are really, really important. One that sometimes comes up as well is sexual selection, which happens, uh, a really easy example of that is with lions um, or peacocks because the males of those two species have very distinguishing features. So like the big mane of the lion or the beautiful tail of the peacock um, is something that the females in that, in that breed or in that um, species actually select for. And that can actually lead to changes as well. Um, um, and the reason I want to spend time talking about this is because this is one of those examples that AP loves to cover 
just because they use it all the time on the AP exam. Um, I've seen it in free responses. I've seen it in multiple choice questions. And so it's a really important one to um, make sure you're familiar with. So as you'll notice in that picture, there's a darker moth on the top and a lighter one that looks peppered, like you sprinkled some pepper on it on the bottom. Um, and this all has to do with um, going into to the environment in which these uh, moths live. So they live on birch trees, which are like a nice, white, beautiful tree. We don't have any in Chicago, but they're very common in the Northeast. Um, and because of that, for the most part, these moths were of lighter colors. Fast forward, Industrial Revolution, we're burning coal, which is filthy and terrible for the environment. And so it's just spewing toxic gas and dust and debris and pollution into the air. And it actually ends up creating something called tree smog, which is just coating these trees with like soot and dirt and debris. Um, because of that, those white moths no longer have the advantage to survive and reproduce, okay? So they are actually sticking out to all the predators and are therefore getting eaten, whereas our darker moths are surviving because they're capable of blending in. They're not getting eaten by predators, and therefore they uh, are making babies, and we're seeing more of that. Okay, so this is an example of directional selection because we're pushing towards one extreme phenotype. We're pushing towards the darker phenotype um, and away from the lighter phenotype just due to the environmental change. Something really, 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 really important to understand is that no light peppered moths adapted to become darker peppered moths. Don't say that. Even if you know that that's not true, don't use that verbiage because it's completely inaccurate, right? The adaptation is the darker coloring. The adaptation is the darker coloring. So what happens to the white moths? They're not adapting at all. They're dying. They're just being eaten. They're dead. Okay? It's the darker ones that are reproducing and therefore have the adaptation and can, um, re and can pass their genes on, and that's why we see more of them. Okay? Something that I always tell my students is that natural selection can only act upon phenotypes and phenotypes that already exist among the population. Okay? So natural selection and evolution, they don't make any new crazy things just because it seems necessary. Right? You don't get to all of a sudden become spotted if that's something that's beneficial in your environment. So if you can't do it, a single-celled organism or a simple insect can't do that either. Um, so just make sure you're being really careful. Nothing is actually adapting. Um, it's just the things with the more beneficial traits are the ones that are surviving and therefore reproducing.